expenses. <laughs> we'll give you the receipt. <laughs> Take your photograph. <laughs> Did our fire chief change? No, no, no. no. Um, I came in late last meeting and he was giving someone else. Oh, that's the CHP. Yeah, it was Sturt and now is. Yeah, Janice? Yeah, something like that. He was retiring and the yeah. other guy was. Yeah. Okay, it's three o'clock. We have one hour. Oh, there's the chairperson. Debbie. So, do we need a chair? Yes, you we are. have. You are the chair. Oh, I am the chair. Yes, you when are. When did that uh, happen? Last <laughs> <Last night>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, it's three o'clock. I'll call to order the administrative finance committee. Uh, today is Wednesday, November thirteenth, twenty twenty-four. Um, and I'd like the records to reflect those who are present uh, in the room and on the Zoom call. So with that, we'll open up to the first item, which is the audit. Uh, the committee is meeting with the auditors to discuss the annual audit, uh, the progress and preparation of the financial statements. And I believe we have our external auditors uh, on Zoom. Um, so I'll, with that, um, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I don't have much to uh, yeah, uh... Paul and, oh, and Jared, Jared are, are here, and I hope they can see and hear you. Um, and um, I don't know if you or Natalie have comments first before turning it over to. We, I do not. I don't have any comments either. No. Okay. Well, then I'll turn it over to um, one of you. I'll let you decide who wants to speak um, from Nigel and Nigel. Nigro and Nigro, the Sicilians. I'm yeah, to read the sign back there, and it's not very visible from my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so we brought um, uh, this May. We brought out a team of um, was it May or June? Maybe in June. June. Yeah, we brought yeah, out, June. June. We brought out a team of six out there to the district, and uh, got a chance to sit where you guys were sitting right there, and did our annual test work, um, getting to understand the uh, segregation of duties, internal controls, uh, processing of transactions throughout the year, um, had a nice conversation uh, with board member. And uh, we uh, just, you know, that's how we started off the engagement and then waiting for the numbers here to come to rest. And, uh, you know, I get, uh, I paid Jared to make me look good. So I'm gonna let him <laughs> talk right now about how the process is going, how the numbers are coming to rest, so. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Paul mentioned, my name is Jared. I'm a senior manager with uh, Nigro and Nigro, and I've kind of been working with Natalie to get the audit complete here. Uh, as mentioned, we were out there in May. Uh, we kind of did the, the legwork of the audit. Uh, this is a second year audit now, so we're a little more familiar, uh, understanding what we're looking at and, you know, working with the, uh, with the staff and with Natalie. Uh, so we're actually just wrapping up the field work now. Everything's gone smoothly. Uh, no concerns, no major adjustments. Uh, we just kind of helped book the uh, pension and OPEB liabilities, the changes to those, as well as the uh, GASB 87 for leases, which is uh, only a couple of years old now. All the numbers are cut looking good. Uh, like I mentioned, no concerns. Everything, you know, revenue is, everything's comparable. Uh, Yeah, everything's comparable. Investment earnings are up quite a bit, uh, which is good for us, uh, what we like to see. Uh, now that we're actually in an environment with uh, interest rates have been above zero for the first time in many years, we wanted to see that investment earnings are uh, kind of benchmark where we where we think they should be. So that looks good there. Uh, no new GASBs this year that affected the financial statements. Um, one coming through next year, which is pretty minor, just has to do with kind of the compensated absences, vacation payable liability. Uh, so nothing that affects the financials this year. Uh, like I said, we're pretty much wrapped up here, going to uh, do a final review and then we can move into financial reporting. So just want to discuss a little bit with uh, Natalie and the board here about the expectations of what, what the timing is when we want to do the board presentation, the final presentation. So. Yeah, we kind of audit towards expectations overall. And, you know, one of the ones now that we're seeing interest rates have risen and fixed income securities, bond market on fire, 
that their you know investment management is an aspect of control of your cash, a fiduciary duty. You know, we're auditing. Last year we audited towards expectations of we're expecting two percent of your portfolio. This year we're expecting at least four percent, um, and we'll discuss that at final once we got the final numbers and look over the information how that's working overall for the organization. So. So I know Jeff and I were talking this morning about a timeline. I think originally we were saying or aiming for like the December 3rd board meeting. But if that was the case, Jeff and I are both out the week before is the Thanksgiving week and we're gone. So we would need something by really like Monday or Tuesday of next week in order to be able to do that. So if not, we would need to push it to the following board meeting. So have you or Jeff seen the... No. Draft audit report? No. no. Okay. Yeah, we don't have a draft at this point. Uh, realistically for us, Natalie, that being uh, kind of the middle of busy season here and with Thanksgiving coming up, we would probably ask that we can do that second uh, board meeting in December. That would give us a little more time to get a draft together and have it go through our internal review process before sending it over uh, to Jeff and yourself for review. Yeah, because I would like to have Jeff and Natalie take a look at um, – whatever it is that you're going to present to the committee or to yeah. the uh, board in advance. So you have an opportunity to ask questions of them and, and seek any clarification before anything that is in a final form sure. that's presented to the board. So if it can't be done um, by the December 3rd meeting, then we're looking at December uh, the second meeting in December, which would yeah, be yeah, and really our internal deadline is going to be going to fall much a little earlier than that because in order to get it to your meeting on December seventeenth, we wanted the agenda packet, you know, by the middle of the, the week before, and we would like time. So, do you think we could get a draft by like the end of the first week of December? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Okay. I think we should. Okay. We'll, so we'll, 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 and we'll need, we have some other suite, but not, not only is the board dependent on this draft, we have our measure A oversight committee that's reviewing this too. And we have, we set a committee meeting for December 9th with the anticipation that we'd have this. So mm -hmm. we may want to reach out. We, we will need to talk internally to determine if we need to postpone that meeting. Um, to, to January, well, a little bit later, later just a little later, just because, um, they won't really, if we're going to only have an internal document on December 9th, I won't have something to share with them that quickly. Or December 6th, I won't have something we could share with them that soon. So do you want to share it with them before the board season? No, no, not necessarily. No? Okay. But I don't know that we'll have anything that's, if we have any questions, we'll, we may not, if we get it on December 6th, we won't have it in time to to get it to them before they're. Yeah, because you know. I don't know what the adjusting entries are or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. But if the board's good, if the committee's good with this coming to the board on the seventeenth, that's probably the only impact. Any measure A oversight. Any committee. concerns, comments? Found no. It. Okay. So then we'll shoot for um, getting a draft to um, the district. What the first week of, by the end of the first week of December, December six. December six. Okay. Does that work? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. And then um, that will give you time to review it um, and then get it in the packets for the December 17th board meeting. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. All right. Any other comments um, on the audit at this point in time? No, good. No, nothing from us. So it sounds like it just went relatively smoothly for you. Um, this is the second time that you've done this audit for the district. Um, Correct. Smoother than the year before. Um, uh, yeah, smoother in the aspect that, you know, we're familiar with the accounts and the financials and, you know, kind of what the district has going on there. Uh, last year was smooth uh, for a first year audit. No issues working with the staff or getting information. And and that was the same this year. Everything has been very timely and uh, got responses to our questions. So no concerns. And then I heard previously that there were no concerns that came out of this particular audit that uh, you would like to share. Yeah, no concerns. I will do a final review and then I'll go over the entries with Natalie and see if there's any you know other entries that need to be booked. But as of now, everything's looked good and we've been happy with what we've seen. Okay. Well, thank you, Natalie. I know that um, sometimes and from my own personal experience, 
auditors can be a thorn in, their, in your side <laughs> uh, to your day-to-day -day operations. Um, so I appreciate all your efforts um, and Jeff as well. So, um, and thank you for um, having a smooth audit. Um, so uh, look forward to seeing that. Uh, any other comments uh, from anyone before we move on to the next item? Okay, um, with that, um, are you staying for this uh, discussion or? They, they don't need you. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, calling in this afternoon. Our uh, pleasure, and, thank you. Um, thank we'll you. see you on uh, December 17th, I'm sure. All right. Okay, have a nice Thanksgiving, we'll see you then. You too, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, let's move on to the next topic, which is the review of our strategic financial policies. Um, yes, thank you much. <clears throat> So the, there is an expectation that this committee would be reviewing the strategic financial policies. Oh, we had, I thought it was annually and we didn't do so earlier this year. So I, play, I placed it on this agenda and I don't intend, my intent is not to go through this, you know, sort of line by line, but maybe topic by topic. See, uh, we, we, we do have a couple of areas that we want to hide, that we want to call to your attention as separate attachments uh, or separate links. Uh, but you're free to discuss or or uh, consider making recommendations to any any areas that you wish. I think importantly, though, it's uh, it would it's good to have the minutes of this meeting reflect that this committee has reviewed these policies, and if there are recommendations, those those could go forward. Recommendations for updates or changes, those could go forward to the board. And again, staff has a couple of areas that we do that we would like to So do you want to hit on each one of these bullet points separately? Yeah, I, actually I want to go over the entire the whole length of this this this, this document. Policy, yeah, but not line by line. Okay. Uh, and then particularly for the benefit of of being time to provide a little background information on why, yeah. why they exist. And essentially <clears throat> back about eight, nine years ago, um there was a goal to have, you know, some Big picture financial policies put in uh, put in one place um, that the district could follow, and so these these <laughs> strategic financial policies are not that they're not a procedure manual or intend to be like to take care of day to day uh, transactions, but rather big picture items that deal with the district's finances from a maybe a you know sort of a thirty thousand foot uh, level. So uh, they're broken down in a number of ways. They were modeled after other policies that we had examined at the time. And so these are not in order of priority or anything. They're just um, they, they're just uh, uh, broken down by various topics. So the first one, item A, deals with ca ca capital assets and depreciation. And essentially, what this policy was in intended us, intended to do was to to set aside funds annually as a uh, during the budget or as a part of the budget to replace and uh, capital assets or or larger pieces of equipment. That the district owns, so that those expenses, when we know they're due, right? You buy buy a vehicle, you cannot drive it forever. It will need replacement at some point in time. So there's money set aside and available when that vehicle needs replacing, without impacting the other more you know everyday operations. So that it's sort of a savings account to go along with the district's checking account. And so we have now at what we what, what's labeled in our budget anyway is asset replacement funds. That are associated with each fund of the district. So, for example, the fire fund has its own asset replacement funds. <clears throat> funds are deposited from the fire operating fund to the asset replacement fund of the fire fund every year, and those funds are a part of or stay with the fire fund. They cannot be accessed by other funds of the district. And when the fire department, uh, um, if a fire engine needs replacement, uh, the asset replacement funds would could be available. So that's how this was structured. Um, the I, I will say it's a very simplified approach. It's based on straight line depreciation. There is no inflationary factor in the um, in the purchasing, and and so from one point of view, um, it's ex it would be expected that this fund will struggle because we know that the cost of replacing items goes up over time, and so this is not an I idyllic or predictive of what that what those replacement costs would be. It's not based on replacement costs, but Appreciation value. Um, there was a period of years, though, during the, the recession when the district was not funding depreciation. And so many of our funds during that time had kind of fallen behind. And um, it was evident, in, uh, again, about eight or nine years ago when we were developing this, this, these policies that we needed to put something in place to make sure that that, that didn't uh, happen. 
So this sort of, it doesn't force the, the budget, the, the board to adopt a budget that, that includes this, but the policy states that we should be. And ever since this has been in place, um, all the funds have had their depreciation fund or the depreciation for that year, the prior years, I guess it's actually two years old at that point, um, placed in the asset replacement fund. And in some cases, there's been some additional, all the way up voluntary, but some, some contributions to asset replacement above and beyond what these amounts call for. Uh, there are some... <clears throat> um, uh, there are some, if the asset replacement funds or fund balances reach uh, high figures, uh, more than the accumulated depreciation, um, then the the amount of, de, of contributions can go down, but none of our funds are near that level based on this, this language here. And then... Um, <clears throat> Did the auditors look at this? Um in terms of our funds, our uh, asset replacement funds, when they do the audit, to give any opinion on this? I don't think Probably. so. No. They, they have access to all of our policies, but, but this okay. is really an account. It's not a transaction, like yeah, to yeah. item to audit, but they would. Like, like, let's say, for example, you adopted policies that were you know, way out of whack with yeah. what's reasonable they, they could. Like, for example, if you wanted to depreciate a vehicle for over 50 years or something. Yeah, I mean, they do look at that. I do a whole like a schedule uh, schedule that I give them of how many years and, you know, what we purchased or what we sold or. But they don't provide an opinion one way or another in terms of whether or not, because um, it sounds like from your description, Jeff, that we really don't have a fully comprehensive asset replacement process that's evaluated every year. We just have a policy that says, Here's kind of, you know, how we're going to go about doing it, but it's not really evaluated to say, is it sufficient? Well, it's evaluated. It's evalu I mean, every, these, these numbers tie back to our depreciation for the prior year, but so it's, it's, it follows the policy. Yeah, to but the letter. It's, it's not expanding it's not, it. To it's, not, exactly. it's not predicting the replacement yeah. costs. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, actually uh, when this policy came before the board for adoption back 2016-ish or so, there, there was a comment from the public about uh, you're, this isn't this isn't enough, but at the time my recommendation was you're, you're right it's a it's a it's not a it's not a perfect solution, uh, but we were starting from nowhere. I mean, the, prior to this, it was just like if there's money available, we'll put an asset replacement. Yeah. Like like if there's excess, if there's a surplus, it would go there. I mean, it's getting interest. Yeah, know? it's earning yeah, interest. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Interest and in yeah, the funds earn its own interest. That's true. Uh, but for example, it's hard to predict, even if you had an inflationary factor, what would it be? Some items, like for, for example, well, computers is the last example. Because we, we, so by the, by the way, we only um, depreciate and use asset replacement for more significant purchases. Yeah. Under this policy, items have to be $5,000 or more, unless it's land. Um, and then it, you can't combine multiple items into one purchase and, 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 uh, and, and use these funds uh, to to either purchase them or they're not calculated in depreciation that that create these calculations or that determine the amount of depreciation that has occurred. Uh, but for example, like a fire engine, you know, we let's say we bought a fire engine 15 years ago, just hypothetically, for three hundred thousand dollars, we would have depreciated it and we would have set aside three hundred thousand dollars replacement to replace it. That fire engine is now more than a million dollars, so three hundred thousand dollars is pretty woefully insufficient. But not everything has a, has a, has gone up in cost like a fire engine. Mm -hmm. um, other other items are have gone up in a more modest way. So, for example, you know, pickup truck maybe that went from thirty thousand to maybe it's you know gone up seventy five percent or something in the same fifteen years, whereas a fire just gone up three hundred percent. So, anyways, the policy does not address that mm -hmm. uh, replacement cost. It you could have more complicated. Um, systems, but then either you're spending a lot of time trying to figure out what those are, or you're 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 just adding. You could add, you know, re, you know, replace a, a factor. And some funds could afford it, and other funds couldn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, 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 it could be, it would create operational challenges. So, do you think we're still digging our way out of when the 2008, when there for that period of time where there was no money set aside for? Uh, replacement cost? 
I think we've made really good progress in most most of the funds. The fire fund is mm -hmm. is probably the biggest exception. Um, this policy also has uh, <clears throat> the, the the years for determining depreciation. This has been kind of um, changed a little, you know, just a couple years ago. For example, fire apparatus mm -hmm. got expanded being up to 15 years a couple years ago when the, the board made that determination. Um, also, there are other a few other ways that money goes in the asset replacement account based on this policy if we sell an asset. The proceeds from that sale go back to asset replacement, regardless of what was the value of, that it was sold for. Um, and so. when they were going on the fire calls, too, we're, I think we're putting the money from the. Uh, we from put, the yeah, we've been yeah. fire, we've put additional funds in, right? Yeah. Sort of like the those voluntary contributions of, out, out of county fire if they were associated with the engine. And then. Because been, we need to build up that. Yeah, the fire mm -hmm. fund's the one that's in yeah. most, in the worst shape. Um, cash reserves, basically we have a 25% reserve policy on all of our operating funds. And that's handled on the summary of fund balances in the, in the budget. Um, and the reason for that is to deal with emergencies or cash flow. There's a number of reasons um, uh, for, for maintaining that reserve uh, program. And that's actually worked fine. Um, um, it's really, a, the reserves is kind of on paper, but you see it in the summary of fund balance on the on the uh, on the budget, uh, debt service <laughs> reserve. Um, we have uh, additional funds that are set aside for that. And as a matter of fact, one of our debt instruments has has us deposit. There's a requirement of the program is to deposit one year's payment in a separate account. Um, yeah, just a general ledger account. Uh, we have a policy on debt issuance and discussing, you know, standards for debt financing and financing criteria, refinancing um, pro um, savings. We don't have a lot of debt. We don't issue a lot of debt. Yeah. We're not involved in this uh, very much, so this doesn't come about much. But this was some, some guidelines that could be followed when the if there was uh, either the consideration to issue uh, debt for, for example, for making a purchase or refinancing that debt. So, what is the GFOA? Guidelines. What does that stand for? GFO? Uh, Government Finance Officers Association. Oh, okay. <laughs> and is that still the guideline? Is still three to five percent savings, or has that changed? Uh, I don't know. Look it up. We haven't okay. again. We haven't considered refinancing any debt. So no, but I think if if their guidelines have changed, I, I, I think it'd be appropriate to update just for consistency. Do we have any debt? <clears throat> we do. Um, we have debt associated with um, the 2019, we're finished in 2019, um, uh, USCUP or Eastside Force Main Project. Um, it's uh, through a, a, a pr pretty low interest rate state loan um, that we have. Uh, it's administered through the um, CWSRF yeah. uh, program, revolving loan program for infrastructure. Um, the NASI. And then the NASI Minnow, we have we make debt payments associated with the NASI Minnow pipeline project, but it's technically not our debt, although we're kind of attached to it. We didn't issue it. The, the county flood control district did, and then we committed as a part of that debt to to pay our portion and so we have annual reporting requirements and those kind of things associated with that and that has been refinanced before again it wasn't our call it wasn't it's not our debt so we really had no choice but uh, the, the, the flood control district did refinance that to a, for a lower interest rate although that's probably been about six years ago at this point i want to say it was maybe about 2017 or 18. 2018. Oh, okay. when will that when will our our debt be paid on, paid on that well, must probably another wow. 25 more years or something. Um, we have a, a policy uh, for uh, obligations for new development. Essentially, the district stri will strive for new development to cover its, its own costs through mitigation fee program, and we've adopted fees to, to cover those costs. And in general, this policy has been followed. 
Um, there, there was one example we had that the board adopted fees that were quite a bit lower than what our master plan had had uh, suggested what were necessary. Um, but all the other, that's for parks and recreation, but all of the other uh, capital fees uh, are that are adopted in line with what the fee, the fee recommendations and the master plans had recommended. Um, and these are these are fees that are not paid by current residents. They're paid. They're one-time fees associated with, with new development. So if a house is built, we know there's one-time costs to the district to absorb that that new home. So it's supposed to be evaluated every five years. Uh, if actually the master plan is so. So for parks and rec, which I know you're right, we ended up cutting it like almost in half. Um, when should we like look at that? Uh, because obviously all the expenses have gone up. So is that something, or is that five years? Uh, or, and if it's five years, then it's time to look at it, right? Yeah, I mean, you can spend time on it. Okay. We can, um, I mean, yeah, there's no harm in looking at it. I guess we we were, we're going to very much struggle to meet anything in that master plan. Yeah. So we need to look at our master plan mm -hmm. and then maybe then say, okay, these are the stuff that we really want in there and then look at Determine that is there a, is there a, yeah yeah is there the willingness to impose the fees that would help make those yeah. possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be something that yeah I think we should discuss. Uh, Strategic plan. Yeah, yeah. 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 I agree. Um, there's a section on budget controls, um, and what kind of reporting that uh, the, the board receives. Um, and how the budget process works. This committee. We'll review the um, draft, not even a draft, it's you know, line item budgets before it's assembled into a draft budget for the board's further review and then ultimate consideration. So this committee does, does have a role in reviewing the line item uh, budgets before they go to the board uh, as a part of the annual budget process. Typically that's like in early May. There's a section, there's a, uh, this, this uh, budget contr control section also has a reference to the administrative allocation uh, program or, or how we allocate the admin, admin fund of the district across the, the various other operational funds. And um, that report that created that admin allocation program is attached as, as exhibit A to um, this strategic vision policies and the copy that was included, I, uh, was included <laughs> shows this shows that report that was done a couple of years back. Um, there's been some more recent that so that, that's only a couple of years old that reference uh, or less. Then the community facilities district funding allocation we we created a CFD back in 2017. And for many years, it produced like no income and then very little income. And then over time, it's beginning to grow. Uh, I think this year it's going to have revenue of, of about $75,000. Um, and so over the past couple of years, there's been quite a bit more discussion about it. when should we allocate the CFD revenues and uh, where should they go? And just actually just last year, there were over the last say, uh, 18 months or so, there's been some, there's been some committee, this committee and then later an ad hoc committee of the board made recommendations to allocate it uh, to the fire fund originally for a fairly short, uh, the first, I believe it was $80,000 a year um, to the fire fund to cover the, the asset replacement costs associated with the new fire engine that was anticipated and later became uh, ordered. You know, it's under on, on its way at this point, or or uh, it, we're in line to receive it. Um, and then later on, uh, it was recommended that the this uh, the allocation of CFD funds, one hundred percent of the CFD funds through fiscal year twenty nine thirty, be allocated to the fire fund um, to cover anticipated shortfalls in operations uh, during that time. And so essentially the CFD funds are kind of now kind of tied up for that next, uh, say, six years or so, uh, according to this policy. Um, then there's uh, uh, 
also about this time is when we started tackling the, the district's, uh, what's, what we label OPEB or other post-employee benefits fund. Essentially for the district, this means retiree health care. Prior to this, prior to the adoption of this policy, the district was just paying, was paying retiree health care on a, on a, um, uh, as you go basis. In other words, we, we just paid it each year with a, you know, budgeted for it each year and it was a growing cost and we weren't setting aside money to cover those costs in the future, even though we had taken some steps to begin to reduce the growth of that liability. I say began because it's still growing, but, um, the, the district imposed uh, other policies that essentially um, reduce the benefits for employees hired after 2000, May of 2014, so they didn't accrue at the same pace once they retired. Nonetheless, by that point in time, there were already quite a few retired employees and then current employees that were eligible for this uh, post-retirement um, health care benefit. So uh, this really kind of, this Policy really talks about how we scale up the the contributions. Well, uh, a few years ago, we re we reached a point where we were able to fully fund this OPEB um, liability, at least according to the um, actuarial analysis that was done at the time. Uh, but this is still somewhat in flux. You know, the liabilities continue to grow, can grow due to increasing costs of health insurance, and we've gone through a few couple of years of kind of high uh, health care increases. And then uh, additionally, there's there's investment risk. We, we put this fund, these funds in a OPEB trust and um, that tr the value of that trust can kind of go up and down. And so the last I brought to this committee, I think in May, kind of some an analysis that PERS had done showing that, you know, maybe we we had reached a point where we were fully funded. And then they, they kind of, their most recent analysis showed that, you know, we weren't quite there yet. And in consultation with um, the, per, or the the folks that run our trust, um, we want to evaluate that on a, on a year by year basis, and only only revisit it with the board in terms of putting more money into it if there's successive years that shows that we haven't reached that um, fully funded level because there's volatility in the fund, and putting too much money in the fund has its own risks. It ties that money up, maybe for for all practical purposes, kind of like indefinitely. You can't get the money back out of the fund unless you can retire the program. And we, we probably will never be able to do that. And we also have, what, a lag time with PERS. Um, the reporting is, the yeah, the reporting is, is really old. It's behind, yeah. at least. It's like two years behind. Two, two years. So, and we had this really volatile market, right? Yeah. Like during the first couple of years of COVID, like 2021, was really volatile market. So we're hoping that it shakes out okay and we'll have uh, sufficient funds. But this, this the policy is fine. But there may be a need to to revisit the contributions uh, in the in the in over the next couple of years. Um, building rental development deposit funds. We we have uh, we hold monies in deposit liability accounts, essentially deposit accounts for certain uh, purposes, and this policy covers that. Um, uh, <clears throat> we have a policy that you know that covers what are the components of fund balance. We report on fund balance. That you you, you see that as a part of the. The summary of fund balances in the budget each year. You'll see, you know, obviously, it comes from the financial statements, but the financial statements um, are put together in, in kind of a couple of different ways uh, based on auditing standards. So this um, this goes over what what those components are. Uh, there's a, a reference to a purchasing policy. I want to go over that in a little more detail in a few minutes. That's that's attached as a part of this uh, this same link that you received. Um, financial reports. This talks about the uh, audit of financial statements, the monthly treasury report. These items go before the board, um, and then budget actual reports are distributed weekly to uh, to inter for internal review. You know, that's the main part. That's the main section of the policy. Here's the the uh, admin allocation um, memorandum that that we've now implemented for. I guess this is our second fiscal year using this kind of newer program. It's dynamic in that um, each year we update the formula based on the prior year's audited financials uh, to include the operating expenses and asset replacement contributions by fund. 
So these figures, even though the, the allocation in, uh, in this report are listed here, these figures have continued to change over the, over, you know, over for last year and the, and the year before. Uh, I'm sorry, for the current year and the year prior. And will you know, and will change, I think, a little bit each year going forward uh, based on the, for example, the the audit that you that now is coming to come to you in December, those financial statements will determine what the ask what the uh, admin allocation are for next fiscal year, fiscal year 25, 26. So there's again kind of that two year lag mm -hmm. between actuals and when, when you see it reflected in the um, admin allocation. And this is uh, for uh, the for, for Tanya's benefit. The the <clears throat> real issue is be before we implemented this program, we were kind of on a static. Uh, uh, program the district had determined um, internally the appropriate uh, and appropriate admin allocation back I think in 2011 is that sound right uh, sometime about about there and um, it hadn't changed the percentage allocation hadn't changed over time um, and so it, it was it was not dynamic and as a result when this was was recommended particularly the fire fund was the was one that absorbed a lot of the increase in terms of its the percentage of allocated. Um, and then we did some, but we did some other things internally. Um, we've modified um, the, the cost of fees in the admin fund. So for example, um, one of the employees in the, in, the, in the admin fund or in the ad, admin office is now fully charged to water and sewer because their primary responsibility is water and sewer billing. And so they're not flowing through this program. Uh, so that's, uh, that's... What did we do before we had... Did, have we always had our own fire department? Yeah, yes. When the, the district was formed, the fire, the fire, this, the, there was a fire district here before the community service district was formed. But 1976, when the community service district was formed, the fire district was became part of the CSD. It's just, it's, uh, it's operations changed over time. <clears throat> this this policy has never been my favorite. It just that he puts too much burden on the fire department, and it kind of um, it's um, it's a challenging one to to look at it. I wish there was other ways, um, better ways, or something to you know to take that burden off the fire department because obviously the expenses for a fire department just going to continue to get bigger and bigger, and that uh, allocation. You know, uh, you know, it costs a lot of money so that comes out of the operations of the fire department. It's, I guess it is what it is. So, but now, I agree. It was a sticker shock yeah. um, it, it, when we implemented it. But, but conceptually, <coughs> I'm not sure that there's another way of doing it. I think that <coughs> yeah, have concept to. makes sense. Um, it is what it is. But exactly. I, in lieu of not having a, some other way of kind of determining how to allocate yeah. those expenses. Um, yeah, there's a sound yeah. formula involved. One thing to keep in mind is is the the cost in the fire department the fire funds has increased has increased the most over the last couple of years because we've in, we've incrementally spent spending a lot more money at the with the fire fund than we had previously about double uh, what um, <clears throat> over time though the, the formula, even if the fire expenses increase, it won't necessarily mean the the percentage inc the percentage that goes that gets assigned to the admin fund will increase. It's all relative to what happens with the other funds in the district. So, for example, if water and sewer fund costs go up um, at the same rate that fire costs go up, those percentages probably won't change very much. But I just think it speaks to the CFD fund, which we've already said, you know, for the next few years, it's going to be going yeah, to the fire. Right. And I think when you look at CFD, that's why we put that in place to begin with. So it may yeah. just be beyond that, the funds continue to go to fire yeah. to offset yeah, yeah. some of those expenses. Yeah. <clears throat> so. have to, Until have we come point. up with a better formula. Well, yeah, <laughs> something there has to be all options. Yeah, because it's going to get challenged. I think it'll be interesting to see since we've just done one year. It'll be interesting to see how it changes over the next few years. Um, so we have looked at other like Atascadero and Paso and other places and how they 
run theirs or how they allocate their money or whatever? Yeah, it's a little, actually, it's quite a bit different. Uh, cities, uh, cities operate under a general fund, and so all of those funds, like the in, in the in most cities, the fire fund, the fire, there, there is not a fire fund or a police fund, for example. Those are all part of the general fund of the city. And so, uh, but there is typically allocation back to the general fund from the from the enterprise funds. Um, and so we we all of our funds we don't operate as, as traditional general fund. So our administration fund really works more like an internal service fund, where those costs are allocated back out to the various departments. The general taxes don't go to administration. Not comparing apples to apples. It's just a very it's a different environment. Yeah. So do we know how other CSDs, um, what formula they use for allocation? I mean, we, we reviewed those at the time, some, some examples. Okay, I can't remember off the top of my head. Well, I'm just thinking, you, you know, looking at maybe Cambria. We had Cam, we had Cam, we did. Yeah, okay, Cambria. so we did that. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and did they use a similar formula? <laughs> I know they ended up reaching back out to us asking how we were doing. I don't think I've, I don't think I've touched base with her in like the past year or that. So. so maybe part of our strategic planning meeting, we can also look at that as well. Um, because I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, it's, it's early on that we've only had one year of this. Um, so I think we need at least three to five years to see how it's, Going. Yeah, I think um, the challenge that you'll you're, you'll see is yeah. is the lag uh, yeah. uh, in the data. Uh, yeah. um, again, these uh, this was the formula that was used for fiscal year two, 23, 24, so a, a year ago essentially, but it's based on actual costs from twenty one, twenty two. Yeah. So there's this lagging, and over time it self corrects, but it's painful while you're waiting for yeah. that to occur. Both yeah. directions, for example. Uh, if, if you have cost increases in the water fund this year, for example, permanent ongoing cost increases that occurred in this current year, it wouldn't influence the admin allocation for two, for really two years like later. But if those costs go back down, you'd, you'd eventually see those savings to the water fund, but they would they would follow by, by two years. Yeah. And so um, we're, we're in the midst of, of hitting the increases in the fire fund, partly because we... we Expanded services due to the safer grant, mm -hmm. and if that doesn't get refunded, right. it will eventually go down, but it'll it'll lag. Yeah. Um, and then the, the second the, the, the second hash matter is this is this purchasing policy exhibit B to the the strategic financial policies, and there's a you know a number of sections here. I, I do, um, you know, we can go through however however much detail as you'd like, but I do want to uh, talk about two topics um, in the, uh, actually one is kind of embedded throughout the, the, um, <coughs> the policy. policy. Uh, and this, this is a relatively new policy. I think it was first put in place um, in, in uh, last spring, a couple years ago. Only, only a couple years old and then updated actually earlier this year. Um, <coughs> One of the things, this breaks down the types of how, how items are purchased by, based on whether they're materials and supplies or consulting professional services like consulting services, architectural engineering services, those kinds of things, or pub, what we call public works projects. And that's a, a public works project need not be a, uh, in the public works department. It's a def, that's defined by state law. It's essentially uh, any sort of construction project for the public good uh, based on certain values, and we have adopted um, this um, this <laughs> uniform public construction cost accounting act. Um, we've 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 adopted that into our code, and so that provides to a certain extent some flexibility about how public works projects can be um, purchased or, or procured. And uh, we reference in this policy um, some limits. These limits of the zero to sixty thousand, and the, the sixty to two hundred thousand, the two hundred thousand dollars and more. Essentially, the up until, well, up through this year, two hundred thousand dollars was the the max that that uniform um, public construction cost accounting act kind of benefited us. Allowed us to use a slightly less formal method uh, for public works projects, not not having to rely on what what you, we might have also heard of as 
sealed bids um, um, concept. Um, let me back out for a little. Let me see. Is this going to be right? So this is related to this letter from the state. Yeah. So the yeah. So that is. first uniform go from like six construction cost yeah. accounting. So we. Next, and if you, if you know, so we'll go back in, in, uh, in just a second. I'll, I'll show you. So the, the policy already states that this can be amended. This will be, this is expected to be amended. These amounts are expected to be amended. Mm -hmm. And the policy would react to that because it references the, anticipates the amendment. But we have a couple of areas of the policy where there's, where there's some references that probably should be formally changed. Uh, I don't think they need to be changed before January 1st. Uh, but the next time this, next time the purchasing policy is updated, it makes sense to reflect these updated amounts. So that sixty thousand uh, dollar limit that's re reference of the policy starting January first can go up to seventy five thousand, and the two hundred thousand dollar limit starting January first can go up to two hundred twenty thousand dollars based on uh, changes in state law uh, that that are that go into effect on uh, January first, and we were notified of uh, <coughs> of this of this from the state. Controller's office of these changes that were intended because we're a member of this uh, program. Um, so those changes that go from sixty to seventy-five are, are kind of pre-authorized mm -hmm. policy. Um, but I'll take you back and show you where um, where we do think that we should be a uh, uh, amended. <laughs> So this, these are the limits uh, here, and here's this, here's this citation. The amounts of uh, of subsection such and such shall be increased automatically. So the, the our policy anticipated it. Um, uh, however, um, when you when you go down to I think it's uh, Are the amounts embedded in the policy later on? Yeah, they're embedded under section five. The same, there's the same reference to this. So we have the same, uh, we, we've elected to become part of this act and we will, we're applicable. We will adhere to the alternative bidding procedures outlined. Um, and as, and there's this reference that as such limits currently exist or may be subsequently amended. So that the policy already anticipates this. However, um, there's this reference, uh, another reference. So this is the same. This is the same sixty thousand to two hundred thousand dollars limits that mm. are changing. Um, however, there is a uh, an alternative, or I'm sorry. Uh, um, there's this reference right here um, to a two a limit of two hundred twelve thousand dollars. You have a little leeway if the board takes certain actions, and there's no reference in this. This section, section five point three, to the to, to that automatically changing, and so I believe that um, while this is not a, a tool that we that we're likely to use very often, it would make sense to update this to match the current well what will be in, in place in January limits by the Uniform Public uh, Cost Accounting Act, and then maybe add that same reference here so that if it goes up in the future, you have, you can take advantage of that of that same resource without having to change the the policy further. Um, and then the, the, the next section of the policy that I wanted to highlight, or, or yeah, I'm just going through this very, you're welcome to, if, if there's more review in this that you'd like to have, uh, please speak up. Um, uh, the next section that I wanted to highlight uh, that we dealt with um, uh, credit cards. I was, if you're going to go past that, I was going to ask you a question on seven two. Seven two, mm -hmm. okay. So the check signing procedures. So all checks issued by the TCSC shall contain two signatures, one of which shall be a director of TCSC. So, uh, so this is as when we sign the checks, it's not a requirement by the bank. Yes. Is our policy yes? So, what there are and so why don't we have like in terms of limits and like you know if it's higher than hundred or five hundred dollars if it's less than hundred dollars or five hundred that only one person could sign in and be a general manager. I mean I think most places have that. I mean for me the, the example that comes to my mind is the seasonal worker uh, employees that we have. 
a lot of them are you know eighty dollars, ninety dollars, and there's two people that have to sign it. And and like for uh, I mean, what I think about is like we don't sign any uh, any other employees' checks. No, you, you mean like the direct deposit? Yeah, yeah. Made. yeah. It's sort of a yeah. It's a... we're trying and we're trying to get all the seasonal on direct deposit. We've gotten a number of them, but you're but you're right. It's it, it the the I I. I Understand your your point because the payroll checks are the ones that have a compressed time frame. You know, people expect a, expect yeah. a paycheck. You only have a day or two to get that taken care of at the end of each payroll period, and uh, they're all for pretty minor amounts. You could, I think, you could amend this policy to state that all um, that like you, you could we could add a, even a, a, a yeah a one, one check one signature authority is acceptable if it's under X Y Z amount. Yeah. That wouldn't mean that all checks, you know, we'd have to sort that out, but uh, if, if you want to eliminate the burden of having to sign, come in and sign like those seasonal folks, that would that might resolve it. Do you know if that's going to be, a, if that would be a problem with the, if the, with the bank, if we had two lines for signatures, but only one we signature? We could ask them. We could ask them. Because all of our checks are kind of pre-filled yes. with yeah. them. With two lines. I mean, I've seen checks slide through with only one signature. They, they don't check the signature. They don't, they don't, no. I don't think bands check the signature. But, but yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just, saying, I'm just thinking in terms of efficiency and, you know, you know just, well, efficiency it doesn't make sense. did get them all on direct deposit. Uh, yes, of course. Um, of that course. would be number one. Of course. But it's still, there are other checks that, I mean, a lot of them, like, you know, $200, $100, or $300. I mean, I mean, when we signing them, you know, when they're that small amount, you know, the, how much well, attention. I do like all the them. eyes on them. I mean, yeah. what's that? I do like multiple yeah. eyes on them. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I, I mean, but. But, but, but I think the, the, the point of the payroll ones are a little different because, yes. because right. the board, nobody's really reviewing the. the no. None of the check signers. With some very rare exceptions, still put like a hundred dollar limit. I couldn't even imagine when somebody's made over a hundred. Well, it maybe one hundred twenty-five. I, I mean, not very often yeah. for the yeah, the officials or whatever. Well, we have like uh, usually there's reserve firefighter. Anybody who's new is going to end up with one or two regular checks while they're getting the direct deposit sorted out. So those would be higher than reserve I mean, firefighters. Two thousand for naked payroll checks or something. Because again, we don't sign any uh, anyone's. Checks, you know, anyone else, anyone else, yeah. else, and yeah, anyone else. So, well, what would you be? Maybe we, if you gave us some um, direction about what you'd be comfortable with, we can then check with the bank, see how it would work. With if some came in with two signatures and some with one, and then we could we could recommend that a, a, a reasonable limit in this area for the board's future consideration. Yeah, I'm coming thousand bucks or it something. Makes me five nervous, I've it had, makes me nervous because I've seen more invest on I'm like a hundred dollars. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't know if I want to go. Yeah, yeah. See, so, yeah, I see the thing is, yeah, people, this problem starts small in yeah. Grove, right? Like it's nobody, nobody walks home. With, no one steals a truck the first. The first <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I was not. It thinking starts with small dollar amounts. I was amounts. not thinking yeah. a thousand. Like you know, just thinking like you know. Well, even yeah. setting a hundred dollars because I've seen it where it was just a hundred dollars here, and it was a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, a hundred dollars. So, and it ended up being over two hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Well, I mean, we're doing this seasonal payroll. I know, but you I mean you raise a good point yeah. is because if it's direct deposit, nobody's signing it, yeah. and if it's you know so, and if it's those folks, I mean, they're usually what under a hundred dollars. I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to set the limit so low that it is kind of a, it becomes useless in time because yeah, with 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 minimum wage going up. It, it's, you know, I don't know how much they, yeah, would a lot say, of times like 80 bucks. I would say you also have to ask, you know, whoever else is writing the checks and putting it all out, how, what do they feel comfortable with? Because initially it's on their, it's their responsibility, right? And if something goes wrong, it's on their head, so. <laughs> well, I guess it's really is the risk and the benefit. I mean, what's the benefit? The benefit is, is that. We as directors are not having to sign more well, checks. Also, there, well, there are, well. That and also there's times where for payroll they need to get done so that you know yeah. that people there's a uh, yeah compressed time and so the other well and that's more of a selling point is to get them on direct deposit because then there's fewer hands touching it to begin with. Um, yeah, then, we have a problem with we have other issues like with these reserve these part time um, rep officials because they come here to there it's a it's a dealing with the check processing is burdensome because. Even outside of signing it, they come here to pick it up because there's not a place for them 
to collect it. And so there's a checkout thing that a lot of them are in school and so they have parents and it's, yeah. it gets kind of messy. So direct deposit is going to clean that up a bit. But if there is, yeah, if, if there was a, an amount, you know, I guess we could look back and, you know. Well, I guess the first question, can the bank do it? Yeah. And then we can send an amount. Um, well, I mean, I, just, I was trying to avoid, if you had an amount that you had in mind, we could avoid having another committee right. meeting on the topic. Oh. Yeah, do you have um, I don't know if you're talking about the umpires that are doing yeah, soccer that's it. or not. So yeah. then why don't you have another policy that you pay them at the end of the season? They get one check cut at the end of the season. It's a little bit bigger, and it's a one-time pickup. I don't know. Just a thought. I don't know what the rules on that are. I don't know. Well, I think you have to pay. I think you have to make, you have to pay some, pay employees at least once per month. Yeah. So I don't think you could do it at the end of the season. Okay, then maybe just once a month. I mean, what do you guys pay them right if now? If you're doing that, we're, pay, on payroll, well, we're on the same payroll cycle for all of the yeah. yeah. every, oh, every, yeah. every two weeks. I would be okay with the hundred dollars. I mean, I think that well, that's what I'm that more would comfortable yeah. with is a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah. hundred bucks. Okay, yeah, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we, uh, we'll do a little checking with the bank. Yeah. We'll do a little internal auditing to see how yeah. often they're hitting 100 bucks. And like 100, 100 yeah, if, if it was, if, yeah, if we could hit everybody, because it wouldn't do any good to say you don't have to come and still have to set and, and still say, well, I can, I can sign these nine, but there's still two more that have to be right. signed. Yeah, yeah, and we're still in the same. I mean, in terms of fraud, I mean, it's just it's a matter of, I don't know. We just sign, you know. Um, I mean, we do have friends out the check. We do have positive sign. pay now. We have positive pay where we actually upload all the checks and the dollar amounts to Mechanics Bank, and if it comes through at a, with a different amount or different no. name check number or whatever, we we get an email every day oh, okay. whether or not we have to go in and approve oh. a check or not. Yeah, it wouldn't, that, but that wouldn't. That would help with, with somebody mail will. fraud or those kinds of things because you could, uh, let's say, you, uh, you or you get a check and you add a one in front of it. Right. It helps um, with that. That kind of stuff. It doesn't help, help with, like, internal, uh, like, if, if somebody, if I wrote a check to myself yeah. for $500 and I signed it and I took it to the bank, it would not change that because, yeah. uh, you know, we'd be uploading the same information. Yeah. So, uh, but we can do, let's do some internal uh, internal okay. checking. And if 100 bucks covers it and the bank will do it, then, then we can come back to the board. With a, a recommendation, and if it, it changes in a minor way, we can say, "Well, you know, we really think we should have 150 bucks if we want to accomplish this, or whatever the figure is." But I, I, I think I understand the the the, the point. Um, and okay, then on to uh, credit cards. So uh, this uh, uh, just historic. So prior to about a year and a half ago, uh, or when this policy was last updated, the district um, had very few persons that had credit cards uh, assigned to them. We had a checkout system for credit cards. Um, the admin office kept credit cards in a little locked box and we checked them out as needed. And over time that became problematic because they, they uh, either the credit cards didn't come back when they were checked out over a long, you know, didn't, weren't returned by the employee um, timely, or there was a need to use a credit card on off hours or whatever. And so uh, a couple years ago, we amended this policy to give department managers credit card, district credit cards in their name. And that's what, we, that's what we're doing right now. And, the, um, and so, for example, Tom Peterson has a credit card, a district credit card in his name. Um, that has worked okay. Still have problems. Some would say big problems with getting receipts back on time. And so we're trying to address that with this, this new change, too. Um, uh, and so these. So there's a typo in the first sentence. Okay, let me go to the chain, the, the version that changed the, the, the shows the recommended uh, changes. Yeah. To it. So it says under A, as outlined in of this policy, it should be as outlined in this policy. And I don't know that you need and the following additional requirements because. They are the portal. Yeah. Yeah, it's already. Okay. It's yeah, kind we're, of redundant. We can we can clean that. We can clean that up. Um, so what the, these changes intend to do, uh, they, they do two things. Um, uh, one, um, adds that um, in, in addition to department manager, the fire captains can have a credit card uh, assigned to them in their name, and then clarifies that we also maintain credit cards in a generic TCSD name for checkout. We still do that. It just the policy didn't reflect that. Um, 
So we can we say in, in one that it's TCSD credit cards may be issued on a department basis in the name of each department manager and fire captains. And it should be plural because you have more than one fire captain. Well, we have one more, more than one department manager too. Well, Maybe. each department manager, but you it, and fire captain, but it's like, does it include all the fire captains? It's, it's intended to include all fire captains, uh, each fire captain. Yeah. As well as in the name of TCSD for check for yeah. for check. So maybe it should say and each fire captain, as well as in the name of TCSD available for checkout. And I wanted to kind of uh, uh, Tom's here for this reason, but I'm going to kind of talk about the reason why it's proposed to expand the number of credit cards issued. And really, it deals with uh, uh, two two primary reasons. One, sometimes purchases have to be made when the department manager isn't here, mm -hmm. uh, Tom's on a, on a weekend, for example, and then, uh, or when there isn't anyone in admin, like, like again, on a weekend when they couldn't check out a credit card. And maybe more significantly, purchases need to be made uh, when the fire captain is away with the crew on an out-of-area assignment. And we've had this come up, um, either repairs to the engine or a piece of equipment needs to be purchased on the road, or there are meals that need to be purchased, uh, when the crew is traveling from one scene to the next or from here to the, the scene, most of the expenses are covered by the incident once, they, once they're there. Yeah, they're reimbursable. Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I think probably most of these calls that we've been on the last couple of years that are out of the area, we've had to have, we've had to reimburse the captain um, for various expenses, some meals, um, some uh, there was some air cleaner for the engine, uh, ice chest, uh, so just miscellaneous items like that they've written. So does number two also apply to the fire captain? Uh, I would say no. Uh, well, oh, it could. Uh, it, that's something we need to kind of talk about. Would the captain be able to then check out that card to an engineer, for example, yeah. or somebody else to actually make that purchase? So I guess yeah. I don't know that's something. I mean, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that, that scenario group, exists. That group but if is it supposed does, to remain as a one. Yeah, that was that wasn't the intent. Um, the captains themselves are in charge of that crew, responsible for the engine. You know, if they can't. So get there a wouldn't it be a need for us. To, uh, it, so I, because I'm saying is that if number two applies also to situations that would exist with a fire captain. If so, we need to include fire captains in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's not the intent, but I understand. If the situation doesn't exist, then it's a moot point. Well, it could, there's, I mean, it could. Let's say a, let's say a fire captain, they're on this, this, this long call, there's, they get injured, they can't go make the purchase, or they're, uh, they're, the purchase needs to be made, they're, they're, yeah, they're sleeping, and, and the crew needs to buy a uh, part for the engine, then maybe it makes sense to have them check out the card. But the intent was those those groups operate as one. They, they, they're they together, like, pretty much full time. Once yeah, I'm groups. just saying that if if that situation would apply, would come up, then expand, I think you would too. need to say department managers and fire captains um, may allow the department employee to use the department assigned credit card. Over the department manager or fire captain is fully responsible. So we uh, we I don't what we've kind of talked about internally is this this we have we maintain these cards for checkout and we can maintain a checkout card at the wastewater plant and that way if Justin were not here and there was a need to make an after hours or uh, weekend on the for whoever, because those people come, there's going to be like, so they, can check, they can check it out from that office as okay. opposed to carry it on the person at all, at all times. Okay. I think that's, I think that's the real difference here is, is there a card available at work that you check out when you need it, or do you have it in your possession at all times? That's the, I think the difference. And the, 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 these folks that have them in their names, they would, it would be assigned to them to, to be. To and be really this is only for vendors for whom, do not um, have an account or not or willing or to bill us um, right. after the fact. Right. So. And, and I think that's that's why it, um, in the case of these fire incidents, they're traveling some yeah, great distance yeah. in pretty remote places. They don't have. We don't have an established yeah, relationship have. with. 
And so you don't just, they just don't ever use their own credit card and bring us the receipt and we reimburse? We do that now. That's, that's what we do now. Yeah, yes, so you, want, you don't want to do that anymore. Well, the, uh, so the employees do not want to do that anymore. Yes. I mean, it's, it's a, it's really a burden on the employee, but yeah. yeah, they don't have to. Oh, I mean, I'm not going yeah. I, 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 I always did. I don't like having, have, I'd, I'd be glad to give up my district credit card because I just don't want to carry it. But, uh, and I'm, I was always in my career, I've always just received reimbursement, but I've had over the years, 30 years of dealing with this stuff, some employees say, I, I don't have $100 credit available to make, a, to make that charge. Unless they're getting points. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, yeah. But I think most, no, but, no. but it also depends on the billing cycle too of your credit card as to whether or not that expense shows up before you've actually you gotten the reimbursement. Well, it so that's with taxes and everything too. You know, it's just well, you've got to track it and you've got to know to submit it. So it makes it it makes it cleaner when you have a credit card that is your employer's card that you're using for employer related expenses. But I think then it's you have I think front your own money. I think it's so really yeah, really the idea here is there are and there could be, even though right now it's it's been fine, it's it's inconvenient. Like let's say an employee used their personal credit card but then lost the receipt. How would we ever figure out if that was a legitimate business expense or something like that? The bigger problem is it's possible that uh, the, the this this crew could be, you know, four hundred miles mm -hmm. away um and need to get something pretty expensive done, uh, like uh, new tires or brakes or something like that. That's Three thousand bucks, and they just simply don't have the means to to to, to make that purchase. Well, they have line on their account. Well, and that was kind of what came up, and I mean, that wasn't the only item that drove this, but they almost did not get what we call demob, uh, demobilized from an incident up in Northern California because of the tires on seventy one sixty. They were so degraded that these uh, mechanics had the authority. To say no, you're not driving that engine out of here, and so now they're stuck. Yeah, and that was on a Saturday, so now it's going to cost us because now it's no longer on the incident; it's on us to put them up for one night, two nights, and now Monday morning they call, get a credit card, and say, you know. So that's that's the the reason for adding the reference to the fire captains. We've also um, uh, uh, under section three recommended some changes again back to the issue of, of getting the paper receipts it's somewhat problematic uh, most of the most purchases are, are made uh, like you're at a, you're at another location um, so we kind of just discussed internally whether it makes sense to provide an alternative or really a recommended alternative or our, our recommendations if, if when the purchase is made the employee can take a picture of the re itemized receipt not the credit card transaction receipt the itemized receipt maybe I need to make sure that's really it says itemized um, really clear. Take the take a picture of it and email it directly to our accounts payable staff member right then and there. There's no delay, nothing to, to go grab. Just send a photograph. These folks all have a district, for the most part, have district assigned um, cell phones, and it's that that would we think eliminate the delay in getting the receipts back. And so, so wherever we've got department manager, we're going to put a slash fire captains as well. Because the same process would apply to the fire captains using it, right? I don't think that I don't think you need to make that change in item number three. It's already stating that the um, the, the the department manager only needs to be the recipient of the email if the if it's somebody other than the department manager making the purchase. So, like, if the department manager handed their card to, if you handed Employee. it to an engineer to go purchase something, then they need to send the email to Tom and, and to. Yeah. So would that be understood by the fire department? Yeah. Yeah, something like that. So for example, on a, I guess, for like, argument's sake, I guess a, on a weekend, a captain could do the same thing. Same thing with an engineer and yeah. then say, okay, send the chief an email or yeah. send me, me an email also and, yeah. and accounts payable. Well, they could just send it to you, like if yeah. they handed it to a, I mean, because really, you're the one who needs to see the expense. Yeah. yeah, the idea is that every credit card expense receipt goes to the department manager and accounts payable. Yeah, but I, I just want to make sure that it's going to be understood that this isn't just department managers, it's also 
you know, personnel within the fire department as well. Yeah, I think the, the process applies to everyone. Correct. But I think the, the biggest thing we're getting at is if they're going to purchase something, I need to know what's coming out of the fire department budget so I can enter it. So do we need to then specify that in here is my point. No, I, no, I think all it needs to say is department manager. So if and even, it, if, even if a captain gave their card to the engineer, the receipt needs to go to Tom, yeah. not back to the captain. Not to the captain. Right. Back to the, he needs to go to, he needs to, go to the department manager yeah. and he needs to go to cash payable. And that is what I think this... Because the captain, I mean, even if it's the engineer, the captain's going to wind up giving me the receipt anyway. Yeah. So I, then I, they, in this case, then on number three, then it's the it's the fire chief. Yeah. Which so is the department, department managers. Manager. Okay, so you're re referred to as a department, a department manager. manager. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Got it. I can add before it says a photograph. I can I can add the staff person making the purchase. Yeah. Shall. Person making the purchase shall take a photograph and email it. Yeah, yeah. If that makes it clear. Um, and then we just tried, I did some things that are sort of just clean up. These aren't don't relate to things we talked about here. Like just we had some following up and telephone calls where everyone's got a cell phone. And, although I guess there, I suppose there are some circumstances when they're they're out of cell phone range and maybe there's a pay. I don't, know I, don't, I don't think there's payphone. Yeah, I think those exist. I, yes. And then I just it struck reference by car because the expenses related to travel, if, even if it's not by vehicle, uh, lodging. Uh, and then this, uh, we, we've added, uh, except for emergency travel, meals are covered on the per diem program. There are some circumstances when someone has to travel on short notice and, and you know, so this statement, the way it reads, I'm not quite sure I understand. Lodging when out of town on TCST business, which makes sense, um, except for emergency travels, oh, there's a, meals are covered on a per diem basis. Yeah, that, that should be a separate sentence. Uh, or I think this used to be a dash. I can go yeah, ahead. maybe it needs, yeah, because I was having a hard time too. But I know what you're saying. You're saying except for emergency travel. Should be include emergency travel on it. Well, really, we're trying to say meals don't go on credit cards. Right. Meals yeah. are go through the per diem program, which is money issued to the employee in advance or after. So travel. maybe it should say it should say lodging when out of town on TCSD business, period, except for emergency travel where meals are covered under a per diem basis. But even, so here's the thing, even if you were on emergency travel and you use your credit card, it can only be up to the per diem amount. So, I mean, because yeah, we had a conversation about that too. Yeah, the credit you cards are, are, are not intended to be used for for meals, uh, but there, there may be some exceptions. So maybe it needs to be said is that except for emergency travels, meals may be used on the credit card up to the per diem limit. Or only on emergency travel. No, only, only on there, emergency yeah, travel. Meals may, meals may be covered. For all other travel, meals are covered under the per diem program. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. clarify that. We can yeah. take a stab at Because it needs to, because it's not, it's not really clear. Because I know when guys take off at three in the morning um, for an incident, yeah. they're going to stop and get breakfast before they arrive. Well, at they're the not going to be able to get a per diem check. And Correct. So, yeah. but the, the way it reads now, it's a little clumsy. Yeah. So it needs to be a little clearer. Okay. Comment? No. So I'm, no, I'm just trying to. Okay. All right. So you're saying in that case, they could put the breakfast on credit card. Yeah. yeah. But only because have it's to the per diem amount. Yeah. And they would never, it would be three different people. So it would exceed. Right. Yeah, yeah, it'd be but the, it wouldn't. I mean, so they can spend more, but they know that they're only going to get per diem amount. They're only going to get reimbursed. Well, the issue is there, 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 once you use the credit card, there's, there is no per diem. There's no reimbursement right. or expense. If they spend more than what's allowed, then we've got to try to claw that back from the employee. That's what we're trying to. Well, and that's so in that case, do. they wouldn't use that credit card. Well, they would in the sense that they would not normally with the per diem. You know what the what you're allowed each day, and you request a check in advance. 
to and you as an employee, no, I'm going to travel. I've got my, here's my per diem. I'm giving this to you. I'm getting a check in advance so that I'm not having to spend out of my pocket. The problem is, is with the fire department, most of theirs is going to be, oh, there's a fire. Go send a crew. There isn't time to get that per diem check. So then in which case the meals would be the exception where they would go on the credit card. Now, whether or not they would be limited to that per diem, you, and to your point, you can't claw it back. Well, I mean, the only other, the only <laughs> other thing is, is like, if they went out, like went something like that, they, I mean, technically if they're using less than what's on the per diem, they're out some money. Then it would, they it would be, be better if they used their own, yeah. but have paid for their own, and when they got back, got Expensed reimbursed again. for the per diem. That would be the ideal. Yeah. Way. So the thing with with that is some of our younger firefighters they don't have credit cards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the travel to and from sometimes is not on the incident. The other 99% of the meals are all on the incident and reimbursable. And their travel, I'm sorry, their travel back is. Um, so, and again, in route to a fire, I don't think I've ever stopped at anywhere where yeah. I would exceed any type of per diem. It's usually like McDonald's or something, you know, oh, to get What a, is the per diem? What, is it, what are we allowing this? <laughs> but there's a breakfast, lunch, and dinner amount. They're separate. And they're, individual amounts it's like $15 for breakfast and but it's a so, it's right. a, a good amount we're not like saying yeah. like and, five dollars and whatever right. you right. it's yeah. not yeah. like jury, it's not jury duty amounts. Right. So, 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 I, I, so I'm trying to get I guess understand it's like why do we even I mean put any meals on because well, it's no, saying I that it's start. allowed that's the exception it's allowed if it's an emergency and their emergency left out of town where they weren't allowed there wasn't the time to get them a per diem check and I think as so kids, they're having to use their credit them, card. Well, they could do, I mean, like everyone else says, they have They could expense it, but, it, but yeah. here's the thing again it's for the, $10, $5. Or $10. I mean, we thought, I thought we were like trying to do this for some major well, but events that happen, it, it, but for one meal, that's five but or But like ten, Tom but. just said, there's some of these are younger kids that yeah. don't have a, a lot of card or extra money, or extra money in their pocket. And it's typically the captain that goes in, will buy it for the whole crew. Uh -huh. grabs a receipt and then that's what I get back for the entire crew. Okay. So we should be saying is that when the captain or whoever that senior person is, they should be the one who is expensing it. Yes, they would. They would. I mean, that's well, how they, that's, do they know that? Because trust me, yeah, I've that's had... how it's gone. I mean, that's how it's been now. We've, we've reimbursed yeah. the captains when they've okay. been when there's been a meal or two that's been purchased on in route. Does it need to say that alcohol is not permitted? Well, that's in a I lot. I mean, every, every department, every department that I've worked for in the last 35 years, I've been issued a card and there's always been some caveat about this does not include alcohol or alcoholic beverages or adult beverages or something, but I would hope people would know that. Yeah. Is so, so we can take a stab at trying to clarify this further. Yeah. The idea is that Take, take away this fire call for just a second. We don't want the departmental credit cards to be used for employee meals if there's an alternative, if it's related to travel. That's through the per diem program. Yeah. It's, there is an except, we want to carve out an exception well, for this emergency travel when you cannot issue a per diem in time. So when travel is, is planned, it should be done through the per diem yes. program and not on the credit card. In the event that the emergency travel is required, then the credit card can be used in accordance or with, uh, under the, the same policies policy. as the, the per diem policy. I don't mean to muddy the waters here, but we've okay. had we've had incidents where I bought entire crews, other crews uh, that have come in and helped us with fires to the expense of five hundred dollars uh, meals. During a fire, right, but not related to travel. No, oh, right. true, yeah, yeah. true. I mean, I, I guess we need we 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 can we can clarify this a little bit. Yeah, because yeah, the think... credit card is going to be used for per, for vendor purchases. It's not intended to replace the per diem program yeah. with with exception. Yeah, with, so with we just need to differentiate. You know, when it's planned travel, it's done through the per diem program. 
and the expenses or any um, check is asked for in advance. It's only if it's an emergency travel, right? Doesn't per diem it also for after, like you, you get reimbursed, right? It doesn't if they paid out of pocket. Yes, yes. So if they paid out of pocket yeah. and didn't yeah, use the credit card, that. then they could do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think part of the challenge is the crew stays together. You can have one it, one person that's making the transaction, yeah. not three people or yeah. or whatever. And sometimes you Crews are going to change. People are going to change in the in the incident. So you, you might end up with, if if we had the pretty, you might end up with three or four or five, pretty in claims coming back. It's that, which is fine. We could you know we could process those. It, it's you know, they don't, they're not going to be any other expenses though. The district's going to cut when the, when the fire crew goes out. We're covering the fuel. We're covering all the other costs. I'm only part of that reimbursement thing is all directly covered by the district, right? We're covering the. They're not taking their own personal vehicle. There's there's a mileage reimbursement. There's no other. It shouldn't be any other expenses uh, associated. Okay, so we'll just we, clarify we can, that. We can take a stab at kind of okay. cleaning that issue up further. Uh, okay, there's there's one there's one other I think more you know bigger picture item here is right now we have a limit per transaction limit of of fifteen hundred bucks um, that I can over rule override. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and uh, the idea here is that this limit, because we're trying to add the ability of these fire captains to be able to buy tires or deal with an emergency out of town, in, uh, the limit then could be overridden by either myself or the fire chief. Myself, my designee, or the fire chief. <coughs> or the general manager or designee or the, fire, or the fire chief specifically. So if it's a Saturday... And the tire, they have a blowout. And they need to make a two thousand dollar purchase to replace a couple of tires, um, or hopefully they don't have a blowout. But they need to replace a couple of tires. Yeah, um, uh, the the captain just has to make contact with the fire chief or myself to okay that that purchase because it exceeds fifteen hundred bucks. Yep, that's fine. Uh, otherwise, that's the those are the changes. But we can take a stab at the travel. Meals change. Well, this is where I, under item seven, you could put in alcohol if you wanted to. They use a TCC credit for personal purchases. Okay. You want to add alcohol? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. I would add it. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no wine tasting. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they were up in Napa. <laughs> we had an employee who she would have her she worked in cells and she would have her staff go to Nordstrom's and get gift certificates, which were cash, right? So she would take those. So the employees would go purchase them, expense them on an expense report. She was approving it. And so she got those gift cards and oh. gave them out to the staff, but also was retaining some of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we've had and the same thing was done when it came to meals and you know who was picking up the tab for the meals and who was approving it. You know, two hundred dollar bottles of wine. Yes. You know, it's like yeah. Like that. <laughs> our our limits are substantially lower. <laughs> well, I've seen all kinds of things. Accounts receivables being moved around. It's like a person who shouldn't be handling the account. Yeah, I've seen a few too. <laughs> Okay, well, that covers right. those the, the items that we we had planned to review uh, related to the the, the policy. Okay, well, good. Um, so it sounds like what we've got a couple of things is this policy will be revised. Um, does this need to go to the board at all? It will. It would okay. need to go to the board. It's for changes by resolution. Okay, so um, we've got this, and then there's also um, there were some notes that I made here as well that we need to talk about. Um, Future for strategic plans. So, uh, future agenda items. Um, it doesn't look like this committee 
we won't see then the audit report until it goes to the board. Okay. No, I, I, well, because there wasn't anything right, concerns yeah. or anything yeah. that was yeah, yeah, there was, okay with that. If you yeah. had other items that called for an earlier yeah. meeting, you could have it. I wouldn't expect another meeting this year no. uh, and yeah. probably not early next year unless there were yeah. specific um, areas. That and I think that the only thing, there was a couple of things that I noted that perhaps um, for strategic planning, the uh, master plan evaluated every five years. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about that. Um, and then uh, the administrative oh, cost yes. allocation. Yes. We need to kind of keep um, a tabs on come, that. Yeah, I think we need to come up with a whole. And then the banks on the limit, um, the, the signature amount limit, yeah. limit, whether or not the bank would. Yeah, and that that will signature. fold. That will be folded into this policy if, in fact, we can come up with something that, that's yeah. workable. I think I understand that the what you're looking to uh, accomplish, yeah. um, which is you know, but but I, again, we want to maintain our our safety yes. protocols. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I don't know if the auditors need to be asked. Uh, no, they yeah. audit to our policy. You want to adopt a policy, they may, no, they'll okay. audit to the policy. They may tell you it's a dumb policy, but it, it, it's if we followed it, then that's, that, that's okay. Well, but I think you raise a good point, though. It's the fact that we have direct deposits, no one's signing. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, it's a high volume. There's one other typo in here that I just noticed on 2.2 uh, signing authority. In the first sentence, it says the general manager or his or her designee, and it should be I S is. There's missing the I. It just says S hereby authorized. It should be is hereby authorized. And then I think um, the other updates just need to be made as well in this policy with regard to the state's uh, notification on the um, public construction cost. Yeah, if we're going to go ahead and make these make changes to it, we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate those. Those cannot take effect until January 1st. Yeah, well, I think those are the future agenda items that need to probably come back to this committee. Whether or not Naveeb and I are on oh, the committee. I'm sorry, which what, what was that? Those are the um, yeah. items that need to come back to the committee. Okay. Looking up the updates to the strategic financial policies, the ones that have the changes to the public cost accounting. That I don't think that. Well, it doesn't have to come back to the committee, but you were also making some um, verbiage changes later on under, I think, five. Yes. And so I right, think but I don't know. Is there the reason that I mean, why can't they just go back to the board? Yeah. It's supposed to be important. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah, it just, can go to the board then. I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Okay. It's just same. I'll be reviewing yeah. today. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, what other future agenda items? I think it's just budget like, next oh, year. Ready next year, <laughs> you'll <be> budget <laughs> and. It's going to be here. Yes. <laughs> or uh, may. I don't know. We may, we'll may see. not. Let's we'll see how it shakes out. Yeah. Um. And then, so, um, and, and actually, and Tanya's appointment well, would we, last. We we well, no, if she's no, not she'll get, she'll finger be. this year, if she wishes to continue to serve uh, on this committee or any other, uh, uh, that those appointments are scheduled to take place in January. I'm sure she found this months. meeting very riveting and will want to continue on. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, any other items then before we adjourn? Okay, so we have the audit coming up uh, to the board meeting on December, December 17th. Okay, well then I'll adjourn the meeting at 428.